Beginner. The mindset of a beginner, even to the point of considering yourself a novice or amateur in something you've been familiar with for years, is extremely beneficial in helping you view the world as a learning grounds to continually develop yourself and embrace the need for mental flexibility. By definition, any beginner is experimenting with something new and is also attempting to be open-minded, no matter the motivation. Polymaths might seem to be multifaceted experts, but there's a problem with that perspective. A common misconception about being an expert, even among experts, is that it implies you don't have to learn anything anymore. You've reached the fullest extent of knowledge possible in a given situation, and any suggestion that you could still learn more is almost insulting. You think, or feel, that you've already transcended all limitations, and that there's nowhere to go but down. However, ideally, there's not much difference between a beginner's mindset and an expert's. That's because when someone decides they want to become an expert on any subject, the first thing they have to accept is that they will never stop learning about that subject. Long after they've established themselves as an authority, they'll still be learning and discovering just how much they still don't know. A true expert never stops wanting to fill in those gaps. The expert and the beginner, therefore, share an openness to new knowledge and insight. The beginner's mindset is drawn from the Zen Buddhist concept Shoshin, described as having an attitude of openness, eagerness, and lack of preconceptions when studying a subject, even when studying at an advanced level, just as a beginner in that subject would. Every time you come across a new or even a familiar situation, no matter how shop-worn or streetwise you think you are, reorient yourself to experiencing it as a beginner. Release all of your preconceived notions or expectations about the experience. Treat it with curiosity and a sense of wonder, as if you were seeing it for the first time. As a quick illustration, imagine you see a herd of zebras outside of your bedroom window. Hopefully a novel situation for you. Once you get over your initial shock, what are your initial observations and questions? Does this situation remind you of something you're already familiar with or have seen in a movie, perhaps? You try to make sense of it all and construct a narrative to understand it. What happened beforehand and what will happen after? What details are surprising or downright odd when you think beyond first glance? You'd certainly focus on questions of why and how. You would probably also be overwhelmed with sensation and stimuli. You'd have many more questions than answers, and you'd be fixated on trying to figure out the logistics and probabilities of such an occasion. In other words, you're approaching this herd of zebras with a sense of wonder and openness. On the other hand, looking outside and seeing an errant bird or squirrel certainly won't evoke the same sense of interest or curiosity. Now, let's take another example of learning how to play a new instrument. What questions would you ask? Where would you even start? You wouldn't know what is and what isn't important, so everything would seem significant at first. You'd probably be curious as to the limits of the instrument, first in how to not break it, and then in its overall capabilities. You'd be filled with wonder and also caution for fear of making an error or breaking it. Again, you'd have so many questions, and the answers you receive wouldn't begin to scratch the surface. You won't forget the immediate impression the instrument makes on you for a very long time. Those are the underpinnings of a beginner mindset. When you reprogram your mind to a blank state and act as if you truly have no knowledge about something, you'll engage in extensive, curious questioning, and knowledge will come far easier than in acting like you already have the answers. It should be emphasized that the polymath beginner's mindset empowers the ability to ask dumb questions. So-called experts rely on assumptions and their own experiences, often without further investigation. When you feel comfortable asking dumb questions, nothing is left up to assumptions and chance, and everything is out in the open and clarified. Experts and polymaths can sometimes have blind spots because of patterns they're familiar with from other fields, but those may not always apply in novel situations. You can approach both new and familiar situations with this same principle. Next time you're driving a car, 
try noticing the things you would automatically do otherwise and say them out loud to yourself. Along with that, focus on what you sense when you're behind the wheel but have long since stopped paying attention to. The ridges in the steering wheel, the glow of the dashboard odometer, or the sound of the air conditioner. Even these crushingly insignificant details could unlock and reveal some new element or impression that you've never experienced before. Overall, the beginner's mindset requires slowing down, setting aside preconceived notions, and paying attention to what you've ignored for a long time. Belief Belief may seem simplistic, but it's not something that everyone possesses. Polymaths, whether through sheer belief or ignorance of the obstacles in their way, believe that with time, effort, and energy, they will eventually reach their solution or goal. Often this journey will involve gaining depth of knowledge and becoming the proverbial pie shape. And with learning, improving, or achieving any goal, whether you believe you can or cannot, you will end up being correct. To illustrate, we turn to the British runner Sir Roger Bannister. The name Roger Bannister may not be familiar to you unless you're a track and field fan or a historian of athletics. In 1954, Roger Bannister was the first man to break the four-minute barrier for the mile, a long-standing threshold that athletes had flirted with constantly but had never crossed. One complete mile is four laps around a standard track. This means to break the four-minute threshold, a runner would need a pace of, at most, 60 seconds per lap, something that was thought to be impossible. The whole idea that a human being could run a mile in under four minutes was considered a fantasy, and even track experts predicted that humans would never achieve it. You have to remember that this was decades ago, when modern competitive athletics were still in their nascent stage. Nothing close to the training, nutrition, or attention we give them today. These athletes were competing using methods that are absolutely prehistoric in comparison to modern techniques. The world record for the mile was stalled around 402 and 401 for over a decade, so there seemed to be some truth to the belief that humans had finally reached their physical potential. It had been lowered steadily up to that point, starting from the first modern Olympics in 1896, when the gold medalist of the 1500 meters won in a time of 433, which is the rough equivalent of a 446 mile. We had come so far. There had to be a limit, and we seemed to have hit it. Of course, similar notions of limits of human capabilities have existed in more modern times, such as the 10-second barrier for the 100-meter dash. For comparison's sake, the world record for the mile as of 2020 is 343.13, held by Hikam El Gorosh of Morocco. At the 1952 Helsinki Summer Olympics, Bannister finished in fourth place in the 1,500-meter run, the metric mile, just short of receiving a medal. Motivated by his disappointment and shame, he set his sights on running a sub-four-minute mile, which he felt would exonerate him. Bannister, unlike all other runners and experts at the time, believed that it was possible, so he trained with that in mind. It was a matter of when, not if for him. Just making the assumption that something is a certainty, and even planning for what happens when you surpass it, can force you to behave in a drastically different manner than you otherwise would. All the while a doctor in training, Bannister began in earnest to attempt breaking the threshold in 1954. He accomplished the feat on May 6 by 0 0.6 seconds in a time of 359.4. People were in disbelief and he was revered as superhuman. For his efforts, he was knighted in 1975 and enjoyed a long life representing British athletic interests both domestically and internationally. Again, he accomplished all this while he was a practicing doctor and neurologist. Here's where belief truly comes into the story of Sir Roger Bannister and the four-minute mile. Within two months of breaking the four-minute mark, an Australian runner named John Landy broke both the four-minute mark and Bannister's world record. The following year, three other runners also broke the four-minute mark. The next decade saw over a dozen people cross the four-minute mark that had stymied runners for years. 
Such is the power of belief. People have preconceptions about what is possible and what is out of their reach, but most of the time, these ideas simply limit them. They allow themselves to be disenfranchised by what they perceive to be possible or not, what they perceive they are capable of or not, and what they believe they can and can't be. Without belief, you're putting an arbitrary limit on yourself. You sabotage yourself and may never even get started. In the months following Bannister's achievement, nothing about those other four runners changed physically. They didn't magically grow winged feet or use performance-enhancing drugs, as today's athletes might. They didn't alter their training habits or regimens. All that conceivably could have changed was their mindset of belief. They were certain the four-minute threshold could be beaten, and they were going to do it. That was the only element that shifted. Roger Bannister redefined what was possible and instilled others with belief. If Bannister had lacked belief that his goal was achievable, he would have been happy with the time of 401 and then lived with regret for the rest of his life when someone else, like John Landy, came along and was first to break the tape in under four minutes. Polymaths believe they can become experts. They believe they can excel. And they believe that what they wish to achieve is within reach. In fact, it is just out of reach, which keeps them powerfully motivated and striving for more. They believe that obstacles can be overcome and that they can persevere no matter how tough those barriers are. They believe that failure and struggle are pit stops along the way. Oh, hey, you're still here. Cool. Hey, since you've got some time, how about staying on the Internet and going to bit.ly slash Holland's comment and letting us know what you think about the podcast? Any questions or comments are welcome. We'd love to hear what works, what doesn't work, and what we could do to make it more entertaining and informative. If you're not into the Internet thing, how about an email? Send us one real quick at hollandspodcast at newtonmg.com. Both those links are in the show notes. Thanks again. We're really done this time. Really.